This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Hello. I'm Marcy Taylor, and this is Hello Again. You know, we just finished with the primary election, and we saw the pundits and the royal experts, right? All of them spouting and what have you. What came to mind, to those of us that have been around a long time, is that the political pundits are mostly young and male and fairly new to the islands. Therefore, they often miss the historical nuances, the subtle distinctions, the past bias. So I asked my friend, Scott Foster, who is a political consultant and has been for many, many years and worked with some of the best, to talk about that, to talk about the things that the pundits miss. So good afternoon, Scott, and welcome. Aloha, Marcia, and thank you for having me on the show. So now, I said that you worked with some of the best. Tell us about some of the best political consultants. Oh, goodness. Uh, probably the best in the world, the man who invented the term political consultant was Joe Napolitan, Joseph Napolitan. Uh, uh, not so well known now. Joe's been dead maybe 10 years, but we were friends for oh, 20 years at least. I worked on him, uh, with him first on Governor Cayetano's first campaign for governor in 1994 and uh, several campaigns afterwards. Uh, Joe, for example, uh, was the, the uh, consultant for John F. Kennedy's first campaign. He was the consultant for the Burns campaign. Burns, yes. He uh, did that wonderful video to catch a wave oh, mm -hmm. that brought the Burns uh, to the fore and prominent and elected governor. And then he did Ben Cayetano's campaigns where I met him for the first time. So you learn a lot working with people like that. Uh, another the one that comes to mind, and I don't know that uh, she would like being considered a political consultant, but A.Q. McElrath taught me, uh, I worked on, so as you, did you, uh, worked on many campaigns with her issue, more issue campaigns than, than electoral campaigns. But uh, uh, to learn at the feet of people like that, when one sees some of these pundits uh, who are drug out every election, you don't hear much from them in between, a few, but not much, uh, pontificating and espousing as they know what they're talking about, uh, I literally uh, laugh at a lot of it, but I also know that it has some effect on the electorate. And uh, uh, I agree with you, it's, uh, I think, because these people simply don't have the his history or the experience to draw on to make some of the silly remarks they make. Well, one of them just really annoyed me no end was in this morning's paper. Today, this one. And it talks about women losing major races. And it's all about gender bias. Yes. They quote Mr. Hart. What is John Hart's title? John Hart is Director of Communications at Hawaii Pacific Hawaii University. Pacific University. Yes. And he said, he called Sharon Marwalki, a political newcomer. <laughs> yes, I, I read that uh -huh. and, and laughed. Now, for those of you that say, well, who is Sharon? Because you don't know. I first met Sharon when she uh, was the chair of the Democratic Party's coordinated campaign. That's been a long time. Long time ago. A yeah. long time ago. That was ago. actually, I think, before I came to Hawaii. Yes. She was in the cabinet for Wahe'e. 
she was in all she has been within the political system for all of those years yeah people get married and their names change but she's been there yeah. as a human being as a woman and i think she's used her her this is her maiden name yeah. i think it is but so there's some consistency but the fact that he did not know that she is not a political lightweight she is not a political newcomer that she does know how to do this and how to campaign and she knows everybody in her district and how to get to know people and her opponent didn't bother well, but Sharon's, Sharon's uh, most recent uh, uh, organizing effort was uh, Unite, Kaka'ako United that began a number of years ago to oppose all of the, the big buildings, buildings that are yes. now going up in Kaka'ako. And she had some great victories there and obviously some losses, but she was very prominent throughout that and after. And so it's those kinds of things that we're talking about that they don't have a political history or right. context or understand the bias. The and for for the, the viewers who, who are not aware, Sharon pulled off an incredible political uh, coup and defeated an incumbent senator, uh, Brickwood Galateria, just trumped him. And so the lady knew what she was doing. Yes. And Brickwood comes from a long, he's Hawaiian, and comes from a long line of prominent Hawaiians. And it is one of those names, one of those people that part of the Hawaiian community. And again, that goes back to the history mm -hmm. and the historical context of who Brickwood is. Brickwood was also chair of the Democratic Party before he got elected, and then he told both of us Oh, I'm not going to run for office. What can I say? <laughs> but, but again, we are talking the historical context of who these people are. Well, let's not pick on just John Hart. I mean, it, no, it, it, no, it's just <laughs> that one just got to me. That, that, one, that, that one, that one that was one, the most prominent. Yeah, that one got to me. No, I'm not going to pick on John. <laughs> He's a nice man. I've met him. No, no, I, I just. That comment was like, oh, come on. Uh, the blame maybe ought to be laid with the media. Or uh, lack thereof. Or lack thereof uh, for not looking around and finding out. No one ever calls me, and I've been working prominently for 35 <laughs> years, well, and I don't get a call. But they don't look at the candidate, and then they say, well, there's a low voter turnout. That's because people don't know that they have something to vote for or against, mm -hmm. whichever the case may be. But if you don't spend the time to get to know who the candidates are and something about them, and um, now, of course, I am going to say it. Those of us, those old timers, that every time Ed Case shows up, something goes wrong. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> he gave us Linda Lingle. Yes, he did. Yes. Yes, he did. <laughs> he did. People uh, <laughs> don't understand that uh, uh, that was the last campaign I worked on, by the way, with Joe Napolitan. And in fact, uh, I went to Governor Cayetano uh, the last year of his term and said, uh, Ben, who are we going to run for governor? And he said, well, I'm not sure. I said, what about Ed Case? Because I'd worked with Ed in the legislature. Ed was a different, different creature in the legislature. I, I found him very progressive, uh, very easy to work with. And uh, so, well, what about Ed Case? And, and the governor said, well, yes. So I walked over that moment to Ed's office and, and said, have you considered running for governor? And he said, well, I've thought about it. And, and I said, what if I could get you Joe Napolitan to advise your campaign? And he said, oh, I'd run in the New York Minute. I called Joe. I said, Joe, you want to come back and do one more? And Joe said, sure, who? And, and uh, the rest is history, as they say. 
uh, Ed called Joe, and uh, pretty soon uh, Ed and his wife were on a plane to New York. Uh, now, the reason we're talking about this is uh, it's revealing the, the reality of a political campaign long past. Uh, the late Bob Reese, who was a very noted writer and uh, PR guy, uh, uh, had never worked on a, publicly on a political campaign. It wound up being Joe Napolitan, Bob Ra Reese, and myself who were advising the case campaign for governor. Now we knew that Ed could beat Lingle, but we knew it was going to be a challenge for him to beat Maisie for all the reasons we know, the ethnic aspect of it, et cetera, right. et cetera. And, and Maisie had paid her dues as a lieutenant governor. Well, all of a sudden, in, in, in the, uh, virtually the early beginning of the case campaign, Joe Napolitan, Bob Reese, and I were stunned to see all of a sudden the case campaign was populated with, uh, I wouldn't say strangers, but they hadn't been around in the early days and they were calling the shots. And Joe and Bob and I sat in the corner for the rest of that campaign watching them make terrible decisions. And uh, in, in fact, after, and there was a point to this, after the election uh, that uh, uh, Maisie won, won. Mm -hmm. uh, I emailed Joe Nepal and I said, well, wasn't that fun? And uh, uh, Joe wrote back, if Ed Case had listened to me, he'd be the governor of Hawaii today. So this is the reason uh, we, that we, say, we say that he gave us Linda Ling. Yes. <laughs> yes. And Ed, if you're listening, that's the reality. I've got the emails if you ever want to see them. Oh, I've got one more, Ed Case. <laughs> And everybody says, why did the Democrats turn on him? Ed became congressman for quite a while. And Senator Akaka was senator. And so those of us that are the worker bees down in the trenches, we thought this is a great election. Ed is safe. Akaka is safe. Now we can put energy into our house districts. So all of the money, all of the worker bees were busy at home. Ed decides to leave the house and run against Senator Akaka. And everybody was upset because those of us that were working in the trenches had to now defend Akaka. Senator Akaka. The yeah. money went to defend him. We lost house seats, and we in Hawaii Kai lost that house seat, and we still haven't gotten back. It still belongs to a Republican. So those of us, and they say the party turned on him, you bet they did. <laughs> <laughs> All of those that were in the trenches, yes. And so, like I said, every time he shows up, something goes wrong. We don't well, know what it's going to be this the time. The hubris of running against Senator Akaka in the first place is what, what stunned me. Uh, regardless of, of what anyone might say or think of Senator Akaka, he was a magnificent human being and was represented Hawaii beautifully for decades. And to challenge him uh, just made no sense. No. But your point is taken that our energies had to everything move, had to shift shift and we lost house we'll races see. yes yeah. and that's the one reason that at that period of time there were more republicans than there are now right and for those of you that may not understand how this works the democratic party is created for one purpose and it says so in the charter and that is to get people out to vote and so it is organized by district and precinct. And so everything lines up for people to get out the vote, to work, walk door to door, to do all the things that it takes. And when you somehow change that in midstream, 
and all of these workers down here have to go over here, everything changes. Yes. Everything changes. And so if you heard in the news about some residuals, people not liking education, that is what it was about. And every time I look and say, we still have this Republican after all those years, you know. <laughs> so enough of that. So what else have they missed? What else, what other things have, have the pundits not seen? Well, I, one thing is, has been the, the reality of the uh, change of guard of the Democratic Party. Oh, ah, that's great. Hold that point. We need to take a break, and when we come back, let's talk about the changing of the guard. I love that. Okay, we'll be right back. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. You can be the greatest, you can be the best, you can be the king, come banging on your chest. You can beat the world, you can beat the war, you can talk to God, go banging on his door. You can throw your hands up, you can beat the clock, you can move a mountain, you can break rocks, you can be a master, don't wait for luck, dedicate yourself and you can find yourself. Hi everyone, I'm Andrea Gabrieli. I'm the host for Young Talents Making Way here on FinTech Hawaii. We talk every Tuesday at 11 a.m. about things that matters to tech, matter to science, uh, to the people of Hawaii with some extraordinary guests. The students uh, of our schools who are participating in science fair. So Young Talents Making Way every Tuesday at 11 a.m. only on FinTech Hawaii. Mahalo. Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, and this is Community Matters. And today we're talking with Scott Foster, a political consultant for more years than I can count. I guess I can count, I just don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's not 35, 35 here, here in Hawaii. Is many, that a, many before? Okay. <laughs> and we're talking about political pundits not having the historical background to see how they miss the nuance, the historical bias, as it were. So, Scott, you were talking about this time how they miss the changing of the guard in the Democratic Party. Well, they didn't miss it on on the surface, but uh, the uh, uh, if if you go back to the previous uh, chair of the party who was uh, swept in uh, by the so-called Hawaii progressives. The uh, Bernie. The, the Bernie people. Yeah. Uh, which I uh, associate somewhat with. I don't agree with everything they say and well, do. But, but they did win. They did win. Uh, but uh, what, what the pundits have missed is that uh, they won, but they didn't know how to operate the machine once they got behind the controls. That and is that, the the progressive the, the the quote Bernie people. We call them Bernie people yeah. because that's kind of a nice phrase. Right, <laughs> right. To, and it, it's a a, a positive yes. positive phrase. I'm certainly not knocking the progressives. Uh, no, I, no, it, I. I mean, and I think, and they ad they identify with that phrase. Well, in came uh, 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 the new chair, Tim Vanderveer, uh, a little over two years ago, and uh, uh, Tim, uh, to my knowledge, had very little to do with the actual Democratic Party. He may have been involved somewhere, but I had never. Met I had him never or, met him uh, prior to that, and. Uh, uh, Frankly, he didn't know where the light switches were. And uh, a number of us uh, attempted to assist him, but he kept his own counsel and, and chose other well, people. But you know, he also had, he was a final year in law school and he had a family. Mm -hmm. And the chair of the party does not get paid. So right. he had to juggle all of that. So I have to get him 
some credit for at least attempting to do this job, which oh, is absolutely. thankless absolutely. and never ending. Absolutely, but promises were, were made, promises were not kept, uh, people were offended, uh, people stepped away, and uh, so it was, and then his decision to uh, hold the, the party uh, convention uh, last year on, uh, on the Big Island uh, was uh, uh, very disruptive and cost the party a lot of money. Not that uh, we shouldn't have the conventions or the Democratic Party shouldn't have conventions on neighbor islands from time to time, but the practicality of, and the expense of people traveling there is, is just prohibitive. So uh, it was no surprise to me that he lost the re-election and uh, 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 Kaylee, he, senior moment, last name? Oh, yes. Lopez. Lopez. Uh, was elected and uh, there's a lot of consternation there. I know, well, but I know her what, well, you yes. do. Well, Kaylee nice is an administrator if yes. that's and the chair of the party is an administrator. Yes, and I, I, I wish it's her huge. Wish her the best. It is a huge and job. She probably will do an excellent job. It is. But yeah. again, the pundits are not talking yeah. about any of this. The disruption to the party, uh, all new. Uh, everything. Er, all new everything. Yeah, it. Now we talked about this many, many years ago. And uh, when Leslie Hara was, Senator Leslie Hara, not his father, was chair of Oahu County. Mm -hmm. And we talked about not having the election of the chair at the same time as a major election. That it should be the year before so that the chair gets acclimated to all of the things that, that have to happen. The many deadlines and, oh, and many unbelievable. deadlines. Unbelievable, yes. yes. So we at least got Oahu County moved to the year before the election. Mm -hmm. We could manage to that, but couldn't get the big one. The state so, chair. Yeah. So again, if you don't know how all of this works, and it does work, <laughs> Surprisingly enough, it, it does, does work. work yes. So again, if they don't know, if the pundits don't know, the experts, the royal experts don't know how this works and why it works. Well, this gets back to the media's failure to identify people who do know how it works. Now, uh, some do, but uh, obviously some don't, and I see those young uh, TV personalities. Uh, well, that, I think that's more to it. It's a t TV personality rather than looking at the depth of this. Well, the governor's debate, the big governor's debate, was terrible. just terrible. And Nobody knew the questions to ask. Yes. It, and, and the media didn't know the questions to ask. The governor of the state of Hawaii is the most powerful governor of all 50 states, according to Google. Yes. Yes. <laughs> he has 18 departments and boards and commissions, 18, that answer to him. Yes. So. Appointed by him. Appointed by him. And yet we have all the strangeness going on. Nobody asked those questions. Well, what about the health department? What about the corruption within the Department of Agriculture? What about the fact that Office of I mean, Hawaiian Homes had to return $300 million and they've got Hawaiians living on the beach? No one asked those questions. Which brings us to the governor's election. Yes which was uh, a phenomenal turnaround with uh, Governor Ige 20 points behind in and the polls won. a few months ago. 
and as someone said, Madam Pelly helped save him. Yes. Uh, but uh, the governor seemed to find his voice and his leadership style and uh, a little more aggressive than he was, while Colleen Hanabusa uh, just really wasn't there. Well, in the, today's paper, it talked about how they tried to feminize her instead <laughs> of allowing her to be who she is. Yeah. And uh, they did the same with Donna Kim uh -huh. and Hillary Clinton. Uh, what's her name? Uh, all of the really strong women, the things that they adore and um, admire in men, they denigrate women. And one of these articles even complained, in the today's paper, even complained about the fact that there were girls in Hanabusa's commercial. <laughs> Can you believe that? That he would complain, Kevin Dayton, complain about girls in the commercial. Every commercial has girls in it. Girls need to see that they can grow into powerful women. That's the reason they're in the commercials, for girls to see that they can grow into this. They girls miss that. meaning young ladies under? Young ladies in the commercials, yeah. school age kids. Yeah. And they complain that the girls in the commercial. So back to the pundits. Okay, let's, let's move maybe to OHA. That, okay, that's real quick, a, that's we have, we're almost lecture. out of time, yeah. Okay, all those, uh, as you and I were talking earlier, uh, uh, all of those candidates, and, and you've interviewed how many of them? Oh, I don't remember. Lots of them. Several of them, mm -hmm. anyway. And uh, that's a big field. And they, they, the pundits talked about all the blank votes. Uh, that's not surprising, as, as we know. Uh, up until just, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, uh, only Hawaiians could vote in the election. And then that was changed by the U.S. Supreme Court. Yes. So that everyone. Rice versus. Rice versus. Uh, Cayetano. Cayetano. Yeah. Uh, so that everyone could vote. But out of respect, I believe, for the Hawaiian people, uh, uh, most people do leave it blank because it, they don't feel like the Hawaiian issues are any of their business. That, of course, is changing since the bad audits at OHA and all of that. But uh, uh, that, to me, was one of the more, that I watched that race as, as closely as I did the governor's race. We are going to invite some of them back to talk about exactly that, about the fact that, about everybody voting in it and and how it, the the rules of the November ballot seem strange to me but what can I say yeah, yeah so, we so got, we're going to invite somebody back that we've knows. got six candidates running against the three, three top candidates who just won yes and which seems strange that they were on the ballot with these 23 candidates all together and you get to vote for well, three. Well, of course, the big question is, where are the ones that are no longer on the ballot, where are their votes going to go? Well, yes, we need to spend the whole time talking about OHA, and it is its importance to all of us in everyday life, because you can't just say that's over here and we're over here. And one last thing. In the 1978 CONCON, at that point, from the beginning of statehood, we had two member districts, house districts, two members. Two representatives. Two representatives. Then, then part of CONCON, when the Republicans really worked at advertising that if we had a single member district, it would be cheaper. I mean, they really campaigned on that. So the 1980 election, guess what? No Republicans won. 
and now they're still complaining about the Democrats, but they are the ones. They did it. They did it, <laughs> and in in today's uh, primary, some of the seats that Republicans did not feel, and they can't keep saying it's the Democrats. If they don't put up candidates that we can vote for, like this young lady. Well, some would say all the decent Republican candidates already are, are, are oh, Democrats, Democrats, have run yes, for Democrats. Like this young lady, Tupola, I, I, I think she's going to go places. I'm sorry, though, that she and Beth Fukumoto left the House of Representatives, because that leaves those spots empty. And we need people like that in the we, House. We need to talk about Beth Fukumoto a little more okay. at a later date, because she could pull off a Linda Lingle victory. You mean po Tupola. This one, Tupola, yeah, sorry. Not, not Fukumoto. No, Tupola, yeah. Andrea Tupola, yes. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you, Scott. As always, it's a pleasure being with you. Thank you. And we will do some more of this. Aloha. We'll see you next time.